Hi, I'm, my name is Ryan. Ryan Freeman, a volunteer with Missourians for Constitutional Freedom, is knocking on doors in Kansas City, Missouri, to ask people to vote for Amendment 3. It's a measure appearing on the state's November 5th ballot that would establish a constitutional right to abortion. Uh, do, you, do you plan on voting yes for those? Um, yeah. Okay, on November 5th. Any... That's a tough sell in a deeply red state like Missouri. But since Roe v. Wade was struck down in 2022, seven states have put the issue of abortion to voters directly, and the abortion rights campaigns have won every vote, even in Kentucky and Kansas. And on election day, at least nine more states will vote on abortion measures, including the battleground states of Arizona and Nevada. On this weekend episode of Reuters World News, we go behind the scenes of the fight for abortion rights in Missouri. We'll also travel to Georgia, where activists are raising awareness about reproductive justice for Black women. And we'll discuss how both of these causes might impact the ballot come November 5th. I'm your host, Jonah Green. Our reporter, Gabriella Border, recently spent time in Missouri with Rachel Sweet, a former Planned Parenthood lobbyist. Sweet is an activist who's on something of a winning streak when it comes to fighting for abortion rights. She helped successfully defeat ballot measures to make abortion illegal in Kansas and Kentucky. Now she's fighting for Missourians to have the right to abortion legally enshrined in the state's constitution. Gabriella, welcome to the show. Hello. So Sweet's first big win was in Kansas. Tell us about how that went down. Rachel directed an abortion rights campaign in Kansas, which is a pretty conservative state. And that state voted on a ballot measure in the summer of 2022, which would have declared that there was no right to abortion in the Kansas Constitution. And Rachel led the campaign that defeated that ballot measure which was shocking to onlookers around the country who would have assumed that Kansas, being a very conservative state, may not have defeated such a ballot measure and sided with the abortion rights campaigners. But Rachel led the campaign that proved them wrong. And then she went on to lead a very similar campaign in Kentucky later that year in 2022 in the general election. And Kansas and Kentucky were Two of the first somewhat surprising abortion rights wins in these ballot measure campaigns post row. I'm doing this because it matters to me personally, and I'm doing this because I know countless women who have needed access to abortion and other types of reproductive health care. Rachel Sweet told me that she sees this as an issue of women's equality fundamentally, and She likes conducting these ballot measure campaigns when it's possible to do so. It's a way to enact real substantive change pretty rapidly after investing a ton of money into these campaigns. It it can guarantee faster change than is guaranteed sometimes by voting for a candidate and hoping they're going to do what you want them to do when they get into office. Missouri is really the first time where we're going to be able to go from zero access to these really solid protections for reproductive rights in our state constitution. But Missouri is also pretty conservative. So how does she make inroads with this community? Rachel is very dedicated to running nonpartisan campaigns for abortion rights Mm -hmm. because she knows in states like Kansas, Kentucky, Ohio, and now Missouri, abortion rights campaigners have to win over Republican and independent voters in order to be successful. Mm -hmm. And to do that requires reaching out across the political aisle. Um, This is not purely about mobilizing a base, right? This is about really talking to voters who may feel conflicted about the issue of abortion, who have complicated feelings around the subject, and finding common ground with them and shared values. It requires getting faith leaders on board and physicians and other surrogates for the campaign who are trusted in communities that are not just staunch Democrats who some might expect would vote for abortion rights. 
she's from these communities. I mean, she is from Kansas City. Uh, so the Kansas campaign was very close to home for her. She did move to direct the Kentucky campaign, but now she's back in her home state of Missouri and she knows Missourians. She is able to talk to people who maybe oppose abortion on a religious or moral ground and say, it's okay for you to vote for abortion rights, even if you go to church every Sunday. She too goes to church most Sundays. She's of the community and people that I spoke to who have worked with her say that that is one of the reasons why she's especially good at getting an unlikely patchwork of voters to unite behind the idea that the government should not be able to regulate abortions in the strict way that the government is currently regulating abortions in Missouri. Is this something that will have a significant political impact on November 5th? Because we know some people can split their vote. I mean, just look at polling in Arizona, which shows Trump ahead of Harris, while in the Senate race, the Democrat is miles ahead of his Republican rival. Missouri is not in play for Vice President Kamala Harris as her campaign sees it. It voted for Trump over Biden by 15 points in 2020, and it's not considered a swing state. Mm -hmm. That being said, a couple of states that have abortion ballot measures this year are in play, such as Arizona and Nevada. And Democrats are sort of hoping that they might be able to ride the, the popularity of these abortion rights ballot measures to get a boost for the actual candidates who support abortion rights who are on the ballot this year. That may or may not work out for them. Sometimes voters who are centrist and right-leaning who support abortion rights are able to split their vote and kind of check the box of supporting abortion rights by voting maybe yes on a ballot measure like Missouri's that will establish a right to abortion and then kind of go back to their right-leaning roots and vote for Donald Trump over Kamala Harris in the presidential election. And if enough people do that in, in swing states, then the ballot measures may not be any help to the Democratic candidates on the ticket. However, there is a chance that if people are thinking about abortion rights and leaning towards supporting abortion rights in a ballot measure, maybe they would lend support to the Democratic candidates that also back abortion rights. But time and again, Ballot measures are more popular than candidates are. Mm -hmm. Voters tend to support more progressive ballot measures in more conservative states than they would support a progressive candidate. That is from experts who study ballot measure campaigns and kind of look at the writing on the wall after elections like this. But don't Democrats expect or hope that these measures might make the difference, especially in swing states? Democrats see it as an advantage when abortion is on the ballot because abortion has been a really mobilizing issue mm -hmm. for the Democratic base and for people in the center since Roe was overturned. When the Supreme Court overturned Roe, that was a widely unpopular decision. And Democrats kind of credit the popularity of the abortion rights movement post-Roe for their success in the congressional midterm elections in 2022, mm -hmm. they are hoping that they can ride the coattails of the popularity of abortion rights, especially in swing states that have abortion on the ballot through these ballot measures. Mm -hmm. And that could potentially make a difference for them in states like Arizona and Nevada, where we're expecting the presidential election to be really, really close. My daughter, Amber, made me so proud. Just this week, the Harris campaign began running an ad featuring the family of Amber Thurman, a 28-year-old Georgia woman who died in 2022 after being denied medical treatment for experiencing complications linked to medication abortion. What happened to her was preventable. My Amber's story has become a lightning rod for the abortion debate, but deaths while receiving reproductive care are unfortunately far too common for Black women. U.S. race and justice correspondent Bianca Flowers has been on the ground in Georgia talking with reproductive rights groups, politicians, and community members, and she joins us now. Hi, Bianca. Hi, Jonah. Your recent article is about how activist groups are aiming to mobilize 
specifically women of color around efforts to address healthcare inequities. And this campaign is is known as reproductive justice. So, so what does that mean exactly? Reproductive justice is really rooted in a 30-year movement that expands beyond the framework of reproductive rights. Mm-hmm. So that's addressing a broader social, political, economic factors that impact Black women's ability to raise children in safe environments, supportive environments, and specifically when it comes to the healthcare resources and the accessibility that Black women have. Mm-hmm. So this movement was founded, you know, in the 1990s uh, in response to really mainstream reproductive rights movements, which often focus on issues like access to abortion, contraception, without considering the unique struggles of marginalized communities, Black women, women of color. And so, as we noted in our story, and uh, which is pretty well known, is that Black women are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications than white women. A real-world example would be, and which is pretty prevalent and common, sadly, is that when Black women are in hospitals, their pain level threshold is considered to, to be higher. So what I've heard from Black women, Black mothers repeatedly is that I can say I'm in pain and not believed. I can say I'm not feeling well or something isn't right, mm-hmm. particularly women that are are pregnant and some way they feel off. Mm-hmm. They are either dis- dismissed or their claims not being taken seriously. And that is exactly what Francisca Shaw experienced. I remember I told my doctor when I was getting cut, I can't breathe. And she said, oh yeah, you can when she was giving birth to her third daughter at a Seattle hospital, she had to be rushed into an emergency C-section. While undergoing that C-section, she had some breathing complications. And I, and I ended up looking at my husband and started screaming like, I can't breathe, help me. Her claims are brushed off, which led to a very traumatic birthing experience for her. That's something that, that's, that's pretty common and that I've heard a lot of stories about. When they cut me open, they, um, they uh, cut my uterus um, and uh, it ruptured my uterus and it bled out and it caused all the heart issues and the blood clotting and all that things like that. Given that experience that she had gone through, it led her to becoming a doula currently in, in Atlanta where she spends a lot of her time actually offering these services for free for women of color who don't really have disposable income to, to pay for these services themselves. It's really sad about how many women are losing their lives because they literally just want to extend their, expand their families. She told me as a voter in the battleground state of Georgia that reproductive health, particularly Black maternal health and Black maternal mortality, is one of the top issues that she cares about. Are reproductive justice activists trying to mobilize voters around this issue? Absolutely, they are. They consider this to be the most opportune time to do so. Not only the most critical time uh, since Roe v. Wade has been overturned, but the most optimum time to do this. And with the first African-American, South Asian woman being the Democratic presidential candidate um, and speaking on these very issues, it's really a now or never for them. And in states like Georgia, which, as we know, is a very important swing state in this election, the problem is even more pronounced. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. And states, southern states specifically, mm-hmm. that have larger populations of African-American or Black people like Georgia, there is a significant not only maternal mortality, but infant mortality rate. Mm-hmm. And these states with higher populations of Black people, those are the states that have outright abortion bans or extremely restrictive abortion bans and access to abortion care. Mm -hmm. And the Dobbs decision, which led to the overturning of of Roe v. Wade, has had a significant impact on Black maternal health, Mm -hmm. which has really translated to limited access and reproductive health care, including abortion, which disproportionately affects Black women. With these restrictive laws, Black women have encountered even more barriers to receiving timely comprehensive health care. And what we're seeing is cases with Black women having died because they couldn't get or they were delayed or denied access to emergency care. 
and these are treatable conditions that could have saved their lives. Mm -hmm. And that being emergency pregnancy related conditions, not even abortion. Abortion is obviously a very partisan issue. Democrats support abortion rights. Republicans don't. But reproductive justice, maternal health, this sounds less partisan. But is it still a partisan issue in terms of, you know, activists work on the ground or support amongst, say, Republicans? I've spoken to a few Black Republican women, Mm -hmm. and while they don't support abortion, they are in support of finding a solution of bipartisan legislative proposals to address the Black maternal mortality crisis and the poor health outcomes of Black women. So that's something that they are certainly aligned on. And so how is the Harris campaign seizing on this issue? So we know that Vice President Harris and the current administration has actually outlined policy, one being the blueprint to address uh, the maternal mortality crisis that is, which was announced in, in 2022. And she has addressed the, the crisis of, of uh, Black maternal health, Black maternal mortality, speaking in states like Georgia, uh, speaking on the cases of the two women in Georgia who died um, from both treatable pregnancy-related conditions. Mm -hmm. But what I'm hearing from advocates is that they would like to hear more explicit and specific policy proposals about what Harris administration would do. Mm. And one thing that I heard that was pretty interesting from a professor that I spoke to is that with Harris speaking possibly so prominently on Black maternal health issues, she may run the risk of alienating folks that aren't really aligned or even aware of these disparities and equities that Black mothers face. Thanks again to Gabriella and Bianca for their time and their reporting. Reuters World News is produced by Gail Issa, Sharon Reich Garson, David Spencer, Christopher Wall Jasper, and me, Jonah Green. Our senior producers are Tara Oaks and Carmel Crimmins. Our executive producer is Leela DeKretzer. Sound design and musical composition by Josh Summer. We'll be back on Monday with our daily headline show. To stay on top of election related news, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast player or download the Reuters app.